So up next, we have uh, Claire Crisp. Claire Crisp has been advocating for individuals and families affected by narcolepsy for over a decade since her daughter Matilda contracted type 1 narcolepsy in 2010 at the age of three. Since late 2021, Claire has served as the Chief Experience Officer of Sleep Consortium. Co-creating Sleep Consortium is a direct response of her desire to reduce diagnostic delays and accelerate life-changing therapies for people with sleep disorders. Let's bring Claire to the stage to tell us more about the Sleep Consortium and their plans. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you um, to the Hypersomnia Foundation for this special opportunity to share a new and exciting data initiative that supports research in CDOH and elevates the voice and the needs of patients and the patient community. It's an honor to be here representing Sleep Consortium, and for the next 20 minutes or so, I'd like to share with you how and why it is important that we embrace the opportunity to accelerate research and drug development using new technologies that are already being utilized by other disease spaces in both rare and non-rare contexts. I only have about 20 minutes to gallop through these slides, um, but I do want to introduce my colleague, Lindsay Jedstadt. Please stand, she's at the back. Um, we will leave our contact details um, for you to get hold of us with any questions that you might have uh, that comes out of this uh, next 15 minutes or so. Lindsay is the CEO and co-founder of Sleep Consortium, and she also has years of experience as a caregiver. Her son, Noah, developed type 1 narcolepsy at the age of four. And she brings her personal passion for improving the lives of people with sleep disorders alongside her professional experience in compliance, special educational policies, and her role within the World Sleep Society. So what is Sleep Consortium? Why does it exist? How will it speed up research and drug development? How will it benefit you, your families, and the caregivers represented here today? Well, I want to begin with a quote. And apologies for me delivering this with the wrong accent, but in all my years of living in the US, I have never really perfected an American accent, let alone attempted a regional inflection. So uh, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the quote I'm about to read to you, perhaps having watched the film or read the book. Here goes. <laughs> anyway, everybody always saying Henrietta Lacks donated those cells. She didn't donate nothing. They took them and didn't ask. What really would upset Henrietta is the fact that Dr. Guy never told the family anything. We didn't know nothing about those cells, and he didn't care. Anyone know where that comes from? Yeah, okay. That quote is taken from a book published uh, in 2010 by the author Rebecca Skloot. It took her 10 years to research and write The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, a true story that speaks to the injustices of taking patient information in this case, actual cells to further research, but without the patient's consent. And it also speaks to the power of scientific progress through the sharing of patient particulars. For the last half a century, biotechnology companies and scientists have used the astonishingly hardy cancer cells that killed Henrietta Lacks to develop countless medical breakthroughs and establish a multi-million dollar industry selling her cell line known as Healer. Poor, uneducated and black. Mrs. Lax was not asked about allowing her tissues to be used for research before she died in 1951 at the age of 31. And no one bothered to explain the medical revolution that her cells produced to the family she left behind. And yet her contribution to research has changed the trajectory of scientific discoveries. One woman, global impact. Now I love this story because it does two things. First, it elevates the patient experience and rights and exposes the unethical practices and consequences surrounding the healer controversy, amplifying the critical need for patients to consent to their information being shared. And secondly, regardless of our disease origin or our ethical or moral perspective, Rebecca Skloot acknowledges what can happen across multiple disease spaces when data is shared. While much has changed, of course, since the story of Henrietta came to light, and as patients, we have the opportunity in our community to contribute to research as our own advocates using emerging technology. So what is our mission as Sleep Consortium? We are a 501c3 organization created to accelerate next generation research, disease understanding, and therapy development for those living with central disorders of hypersomnolence. 
By utilizing a digital platform, leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning, Sleep Consortium is creating a global database that will collect, connect, and share data. And while it is a global initiative, it is the individual patient journey and experience that informs how patient data is owned, managed, consented, and authorized. And while our immediate focus is on CDOH, IH, NT1 and 2, and Klein-Levin syndrome, the vision is to ultimately address secondary symptoms across other disease areas, like, say, Prader-Willi, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and other neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental disorders. In this sense, the work is somewhat disease agnostic, meaning that the platform, which I will explain in just a moment, once it's set up, will be looking at specific symptoms, such as excessive daytime sleeping, prevalent in other diseases, and not be rigidly confined to a classical sort of diagnosis or a word across that sort of diagnostic bucket. So we will be able to look at symptoms like EDS, say, in other conditions, perhaps epilepsy, or indeed even long COVID. So some of our goals are to capture more information in CDOH, urgently needed to increase disease understanding, to reduce diagnostic delays in people with sleep disorders, to improve therapeutic options and access, to support clinical trials through education, recruitment, retention, and to identify new patients who have an alternative primary diagnosis. In addition to capturing current patient data, the platform has the capacity to collect existing data within registries and retrospective data that is sitting in labs and academic and clinical institutions. Leveraging new technology builds on research already being done and offers opportunity to capture longitudinal and time series data going forward. How many of you here have ever tried wearing a wearable device to track your sleep? Maybe Fitbit, yeah, lots of hands, Apple Watch, the Dream Headband, to name but a few. Data captured within those devices is stored somewhere, but it's not being cross-pollinated with the comparable data, which is parked in silos. There's reasons for this, but there's also a solution. But before we get deeper into the tech, let's look briefly at our role at Sleep Consortium as connectors. So our role is to bring multiple stakeholders to the table in a collaborative effort, drawing on expertise, differing perspectives, and collective experiences. Patient organizations are front and center of our work, and in this way, Sleep Consortium is not an advocacy organization as such, but an entity that supports research and development at the interface of industry, individual patients, and communities. This is an innovative cross-disciplinary ecosystem designed um, to combine new technology, existing and pre-existing data with the patient experience being front and center. So we do work closely with allied biopharma organizations, clinicians, leading researchers, and other KOLs. And you can find more details on our website. I'll give, give that information at the end but it's www.sleepconsortium.org, where you'll also find our scientific advisory board who have identified this work as a research priority and are supporting us uh, by providing resources as advisors and early champions. So what are the current challenges we face in sleep research? Well, we know that the data does exist, but it's stuck. It's captive in silos. Take, for example, individual data collected by research institutions, some small, some large data sets span spanning all sorts of different information from polysomnograms, MSLT, so on and so forth. We know that it exists and it's highly valuable, but it is siloed. Or existing data is not standardized in a way that makes it easy to be interconnected, and neither is it consented for sharing purposes. And in many cases, the data doesn't even exist. So the goals, um, to bring together key stakeholders to help define a pre-competitive consortium around data collection, combining and sharing to advance research. Another goal is to utilize emerging technologies. In this way, Sleep Consortium is distinct that it's the first patient-driven and patient-owned global platform of data forming the largest database in CDOH to date. On our more, one of our more immediate projects, something Lindsay and I have been working on, is to um, do some data 
landscaping and mapping. This is to identify where large data sets exist globally and with a view to having them integrated onto the platform further down the line. And Sleep Consortium will help stratify patients within the platform, leveraging tech already in place through our partnership with Rarex. And I will be um, talking very specifically about Rarex in just a moment because they are um, key partners with us in this endeavor. To, ins to assist in the development of targeted therapies and patient access, and here's where we get to work with trusted industry partners, and another goal to use the results of data integration with the publication of white papers and an FDA report. The technology supporting research is maturing quickly, and it's an ever-growing opportunity in front of us to think about what problems do we need solved? How can we leverage the tech to provide answers? Rarex, and you can look them up online, um, Rarex is also a 501c3, that's a not-for-profit organization that has already created a collaborative and comprehensive digital platform housing over 100 other rare diseases. Their platform is structured to scale and systemize data collection, connection, and federation, or sharing, using tech provided by MIT, Harvard, and the Broad Institute. Rarex aligns with our mission not to own, sell, or trade patient data, but firmly believes patients should be empowered to support research in their own time and on their own terms. They are ambassadors, they are ambassadors for equity and inclusion, again, another key priority, and are passionate as, um, as passionate about deburdening the patients as we are. So why did we choose Rarex? Well, because they are not only first-in-class technology leaders, but they also specialize in the interconnection and federation of data. So across multiple disease spaces, this is a unique opportunity for us to upload sleep data onto the platform and also then ask very specific questions, say, through sub-studies, so that the data is interconnected with other disease data. All of the Rarex team have direct personal experience with chronic diseases, either as patients themselves or caregivers. Um, we, a sleep consortium, are in their third cohort of diseases that are about to launch the data collection portal, which will again collect, connect, and share the data with patients, researchers, industry partners. It is precisely the interconnection and the sharing of consented data that makes Rarex unique. The service is free to patients, families and researchers, and Rarex handles structuring and standardization of data, governance, and provides legal support, patient engagement resources for us, and obviously our specialists in data and tech. Our collaboration with Rarex goes beyond the me merely being tech vendors, however. They are a team of leaders, scientists, governance, and legal experts who have a lived experience of the burden of chronic disease, we're not talking about replicating another registry here or duplicating any re um, research, but about the converging of data to reach our goals as a sleep community, namely speeding up research and drug development. This slide's a little bit boring, but it is important, um, and it illustrates the areas that Rarex are responsible for in terms of governance. So that's regulation and compliance specific to different countries, privacy, security issues, informed consents, data sharing practices, and so on. Okay, so what are the benefits to you and your families? Well, by joining the platform, you get to compare your progress against others. You manage who sees your data. You can update any changes in your health status, connect with patient advocacy groups, accelerate research and drug development, be notified of clinical trials which fit your profile and use your information to, as a record to take to the doctor's appointments. These are all compelling reasons to be involved. Let's see how. Okay. So what does the patient portal look like? Access to the portal will be via our website, <coughs> excuse me, and on other patient advocacy organizations' websites such as Project Sleep, and we will be notifying you when it actually is um, completed and open for registration. If you actually do go onto our website and sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media, then you'll see the exact date um, later on um, this year when we will open it up and you will all be invited to 
Um, come on inside, as it were, and complete your registration profile on the patient dashboard, which looks a little bit like this. You will set up a user ID and a password as either the patient or the caregiver. And from there, you will be directed to the consent page, then the sharing preference survey, which is editable. And this is where you get to decide who sees your de-identified data. Then you will be able to complete a head-to-toe scan, and based on your responses, specific domain modules will open. So, for example, if you have a diagnosis of IH, but you also have high blood pressure, the cardiovascular domain will be open for you, and you, can, you have the option to go in and complete that as well. For visual purposes, the different disease domains here are shown on the bottom line as files, and you'll see the highlighted one is us, or you, who's sleep. And by completing the surveys, you are also linked to the other relevant domains, which will open for you, as I said, say, for example, with the cardiovascular, but thereby identifying additional symptoms that you experience outside of your traditional IH diagnosis. This also works in the other direction, of course. So, for example, if a patient is coming into the portal, say, through epilepsy or a rare genetic deletion area, and they might identify with excessive daytime sleeping, they are then given the option to fill out the sleep questionnaire. This slide gives a visual of how patient data and communities intersect on the back end of the platform, and it demonstrates that it's not merely another registry. The different web pages that you see at the top represent different disease networks, such as, say, Prada Willy or gene deletion, hearing loss, etc. Sleep consortium, or sleep disorders, I should say, will be added to the top. Again, this is just a visual for the back end. It won't actually look exactly like that. Researchers, the blank people on the bottom, uh, can pull data, for example, on all patients, say, with excessive daytime sleeping and compare it to quality of life, as well as other or different medications, or indeed whatever line of inquiry their research is going in. The bubbles on the side indicate how the ecosystem of data also includes sets of, say, electronic health records and specific test results, such as PSG, MSLT, and World Genomic Sequencing, and so on. It also demonstrates the capacity of the platform to perform sub-studies running very specific questions by researchers and industry. Okay, what are our next steps? We are continuing to identify where the data is stored, what needs to be done to have it integrated into the platform. This is known as landscaping and mapping. It sounds simple, but it's a huge undertaking. Um, continuing to engage with global advocacy leaders and KOLs. Lindsay and I have worked extensively with other patient advocacy groups in sleep across the world, from Australia to Africa to Europe, um, and Canada and so on. Formation of our sleep review committees and task forces to build out our sleep domains. So this is where experts in the space help frame what those surveys look like, um, what tests are relevant for us to build in, and so on. And building out the data collection portal, which will be launched simultaneously with our educational outreach program. So that's just a fancy way, really, of saying once the portal's open, there'll be a webinar, and we will... Um, be reaching out to our community again through our patient advocacy organizations in sleep, you will have the opportunity to work with us and RareX as we um, help you navigate the system, which is extremely simple and not onerous at all. But it does, it is a leap, isn't it? It's a new idea and it's a new initiative and we want to support you as you support us. And our DEI task force, we're setting up to address, to address in a sensitive and timely manner the issues that were in part exposed through the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. And if last century, one woman without knowing can create a medical revolution by sharing a few cells from her cervix, what can we do as individuals and families and as a community with the medical technology that is now available to us? What will be our legacy? I do hope that you will help to contribute to solving the challenges that face our researchers and therapy developers by joining the platform. Details on the community webinar will be forthcoming. Please feel free to contact myself or Lindsay, speak to us this weekend or send us an email. And if you have any questions, um, whatever they may be, don't be afraid, we're here to help and we'll do our best to answer them. 
And as I say, don't forget to sign up to our newsletter and we will keep you abreast of all developments. These are exciting times. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share with you.